The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Mark. Jesus and his disciples set out for the villages of Caesarea Philippi. Along the way, he asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? They said in reply, John the Baptist, others Elijah, still others one of the prophets. And he asked them, but who do you say that I am? Peter said to him in reply, you are the Christ. Then he warned them not to tell anyone about him. He began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer greatly and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed and rise after three days. He spoke this openly. Then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. At this he turned around and looking at his disciples, rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan. You are thinking not as God does, but as human beings do. He summoned the crowd with his disciples and said to them, Whoever wishes to come after me must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will, and for the sake of the gospel will save it. The Gospel of the Lord. Today's Gospel, once again, is one of those passages that we find in each of the Synoptic Gospels. It's found in Mark, uh, Matthew 16, Luke chapter 9, and Mark chapter 8. There's some details, a few details that are different. For instance, Luke omits the word Caesarea Philippi that Matthew and Mark include. But, this, but the storyline of the passage is almost identical. Now, what's important about this passage in Mark's Gospel is where he places it. Mark's Gospel is the easiest Gospel to work with because it's the shortest, first of all, only 16 chapters, and he lays his Gospel out in two blocks of eight chapters. And then he links them together with this passage from Mark chapter 8 beginning at verse 27. We call it in biblical studies a hinge passage because literally the two sides of the gospel hinge right here. And what is he telling us? Well, in the first eight chapters of Mark's gospel, he has gone out of his way to say to us, Jesus is the Messiah, as if we didn't know that. And how does he do that? Well, there's no infancy narrative in Mark's account. Right at chapter 1, as soon as Jesus comes on the scene as an adult, he is busy. Miracle after miracle after miracle after exorcism after exorcism after exorcism. In fact, Mark will shove the majority of his miracle stories about Jesus in that first eight chapters because he wants us to know without question because of his authoritative speaking and his powerful acts, Jesus is the Messiah. And don't make a mistake about that. But then, after today's passage, the next eight chapters, he goes out of his way to show us what kind of Messiah Jesus is. Now, why is that so important? Well, first of all, let's look at this passage. We're told that Jesus makes a pit stop about halfway between Galilee in the north and Jerusalem, the city of destiny in the south, at an old Roman fortress town called Caesarea Philippi. It actually, uh, several hundred years before Jesus came on the scene, was a pantheon for the Gentile gods. The Babylonians worshipped their gods there. The Syrians worshipped their gods there. And actually the ancient Romans worshipped their gods there. But when the Roman army came on the scene, it basically sacked the city, got rid of all resistors, got rid of the pagan statues and all of that, and they made it a military fortress. And it was named Caesarea Philippi after Caesar Augustus. Caesar had appointed 
a man by the name of Philip, who was the brother-in-law of King Herod, to be the puppet king on the throne for the Jewish people. And so hence the name Caesarea Philippi, Caesar and Philip. Now it's at that point, Jesus abruptly turns to the disciples and he says to them, who do people say that I am? Now, this question is very important. Why? Because when Jesus came on the scene, people were looking for a savior. They wanted a Messiah. And some of the most interesting reading that's unfortunately not contained in the Bible are the, are the books, the Old Testament type of books that didn't make it into the Bible. Books that were written some 200, 250 years before Jesus came on the scene. And here's what you see in those books. An absolute, almost anxiety about a coming of a Savior, a Messiah. And depending on which rabbi you studied under or which social circle that you uh, associated, determined what kind of Messiah you thought that would be. Some people, for instance, thought that David was going to return from the dead, rouse up a mighty army, and expel the Romans by force, and then the kingdom would come. Some people thought that Elijah, as we hear in this passage, Elijah would come back. Where did they get that? When you go to the last book of the Old Testament, the prophet Malachi, chapter 3, verse 23, it says, on the day of the Lord, that is the coming of the kingdom, Elijah will come first. Then you go to the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 18, verses 15 and 18. There it is written that when the kingdom comes, God will raise up a prophet like Moses. And one book that I studied extensively because it had a major bearing on the work that I was doing on Luke's gospel was a book that didn't make it into our Bible called The Testament of Benjamin. I remember one particular section, chapter 9, verse 3 of The Testament of Benjamin. It is written, and I quote, On that day, God will send forth his only begotten prophet. So the bottom line is, people were expecting some heroic, some victorious figure to come on the scene. And so Jesus asked the question, who are people saying? And he gets flooded with a lot of answers. But then he asked the piercing question. Who do you say that I am, Peter? And Peter just blurts out. If you look at the Gospels, Peter's always running his mouth off and he just says stuff without taking into account. And this is the case. He says, you're the Messiah, you're the Christ. And Jesus affirms him. But then Jesus goes on to say what kind of Christ he is, what kind of Messiah. And he starts talking about suffering. He says, this Messiah must suffer horribly at the hands of the chief priest and the elders. He will be put to death and then he will be raised up. Well, that does not fit with what Peter has in his brain at this point. And Peter rebukes Jesus. Say it ain't so, Lord. It can't be like that. The Messiah is going to be a hero. He can't suffer that kind of death. And Jesus turns around and rebukes Peter. He lets him have it and says, get behind me, you Satan. He's not calling Peter the devil. The word Satan comes from a Greek root which means adversary. Or in other words, as Jesus will say, you're thinking the way human beings think, not the way God thinks. And so when he says to Peter, get behind me, what he's saying to Peter is, that's the only posture that you can have if you're going to learn what really is the truth. You must get behind me as my disciple and learn. But that's not all. You've got to be willing to deny yourself, says Jesus. You've got to be willing to pick up your cross. And you've got to be willing to follow me. Luke's account will add, each day you must follow me. And off they go. Why the big secret? I've been asked by students for years and years. Why does Jesus in Mark's gospel, more than all the other gospels, 
Whenever he performs a miracle, he says, shh, don't tell anyone. Why does he say to Peter today, shh, don't tell anyone I'm the Christ? The answer is very simple. People are looking for a good time Christ. They are looking for a hero Christ. What Jesus is saying to Peter and all who would listen, you're not going to get the whole picture of I, who I am until you see me on the cross. That's the kind of Messiah I am. I'm going to suffer and die out of love for my people. Yes, victory will come, but not without Calvary first. One important point about this passage that gets overlooked over and over and over again is the implications of the question, who do you say that I am? Because what we say about Jesus, what we call Jesus, implies something about ourselves. Or as I tell students, there is a functional relationship between what we call Jesus and what we are saying about ourselves. And we don't often think about this. The word Christ is not a proper name for Jesus. We call him Jesus Christ as though he was Jesus Christ who lived on First Avenue in downtown Nazareth. It's not a proper name. The word Christ is a title that the early church used for Jesus. And as I shared with you, the word Christ, the word Messiah, meant someone who was going to come to save the world. But you see, here's the point. If I dare call him the Christ, then I'm saying something about myself. I'm saying that I am his disciples. The Messiah was supposed to come to the world and bring in a whole new age, a whole new era in history. One characterized by unconditional and sacrificial love. One characterized by compassion and mercy. One characterized by peace and justice. And so if you dare say that he's the Christ and he's the one who came to bring that to the world, then the question is, are you living unconditional love and sacrificial love and peace and justice and compassion and mercy? If not, then are you really, really living as a disciple? Probably the more common title that we use for Jesus is the word Lord. We say that a lot during Mass. The Lord, the Lord. You know, during Jesus' day, to call someone Lord was profound. That title was used for a Roman general. That title was used for a great philosopher. That title was used for the procurator. Pontius Pilate was called my Lord. It was used for powerful people. Great rabbis, for instance, were called my Lord by their disciples. But here's the catch. To call someone Lord implies that you are his servant. And back then, when you address someone as Lord, you took seriously the role of being a servant. Or in other words, his agenda was your agenda. And if there was ever a conflict, you surrendered. You made his way your all and all. 2012 years later, we dare to call Jesus Lord. But do we mean it? Do we really mean it? Do we live as his servants? Is his agenda our agenda? And not just when we're in these four walls. When we leave these four walls, when you go to Kroger's or wherever you go, to work, to school, to play, are you living as a servant of the Lord Jesus? I'd like to ask you a question today. Who are you really? Aside from being a member of planet Earth, who are you? What meaning is your life? I'd like to share with you a couple stories to deal with that question, who are you? The first one comes from a doctor who relates how, as an intern, part of his work was to travel around in teams examining patients. 
He would notice their looks as the team entered the room, ranging from intimidation to apprehension. He remembered one man in particular, an African-American man in his 60s, who was very mischievous and very sick. His complex condition brought many visits by the doctors, but the doctor remarks how he always felt the man could see right through them. He would say, hey boys, when they entered the room like they were a bunch of 10-year-olds. He always somehow seemed so pleased and amused and some of the team were actually nervous about him. But this doctor was actually intrigued by the man. Now and then the man would get into serious trouble and they would rush him to intensive care. Then he would rally to everyone's amazement and then ask them, you guys here again? As if he were surprised to find them, the doctors, alive. One night there was an emergency and this doctor took the initiative and went to see him alone. The man looked pretty bad, but a few seconds after the doctor's arrival, he gave him a grin and said, well, as if he expected the doctor. Like he had come to know how much the doctor had come to love him. The doctor looked a little surprised and he just stood there and laughed for a minute. And then the man hit the doctor with a single remark half a question and half something else. Who are you? He asked the doctor, sort of smiling as he did. Just that. Who are you? The doctor said he started to say, well, I'm doctor. And then he just stopped cold. It was hard for him to describe or sort out what went on in his head. All kinds of answers went through his mind. They all seemed true and yet somehow they all seemed less than true. Yeah, I'm this, but I'm also that. Well, that's not the whole picture. The whole picture is the doctor's confusion must have shown because the African-American man gave him a big grin and said, nice to meet you. They talked a few minutes about this and that, and at the end, the doctor said to him, is there anything I can do for you, sir? He replied, no, I'm just fine. Thanks very much, doctor. He paused for the name and the doctor gave him his name. He grinned and that was it. He died the next day. But the doctor could not get him out of his mind, nor this question, who are you? He had asked. The doctor reflected that for years he had trained as a physician and realized he almost got lost in it. He realized that what that man did was to take away his degree and toss it right back into him. And also, and also, and that story does the same for us. Who are you? Beyond the degree, beyond the title, beyond the role, beyond the house, beyond the car, behind all the stuff, beyond the facade, who really are you? The second story tells of a man who had his answer. He began a career in one of this nation's great corporations. He majored in business when he was in college and had a real knack for it. In fact, he went on and earned his MBA. No one was surprised when he was selected top choice with the corporation's executive training program. After a few months of training, his boss took him to the national convention. There he was to get a first-hand look at how things worked at the top and who the important people were for his career. He also got too good a look. He noticed some pretty heavy drinking among the executives and was urged to join in. He was told to get a woman from the supply of those who had been hired for the occasion. When he refused both, he got a clear message that this was not what was expected for an up-and-coming executive candidate. The boss called him in when they got back to discuss the matter. The boss said he was willing to overlook his strange behavior at the con convention if he wouldn't let it happen again. He in turn replied that he would not engage in such behavior ever. When asked why by his boss, his straightforward and firm answer was, 
because I'm a Catholic, sir. This young man is not a holier than thou, not a Bible reader, not a prayer group member. He's a businessman, husband, father, but beneath it all, he knows the answer to the question, who are you? His unspoken answer based on the way he lives his life is, I'm a Catholic, I'm a disciple of Jesus. He was fired, by the way, and has been out of a job for nearly a year, but with his abilities, he's confident that he'll find something. He lost his job, but he did not lose his identity. Who are you? Who are you? It's a most important question to ponder. We come here Sunday after Sunday. Some of you come day in and day out. And you come here and rightfully so to be nourished by the presence of the Lord. But the question is, when you leave here, when Father Jim can no longer see you, who are you? How do you act? How do you live? What is your true identity? Remember, as I shared with you, the functional equivalent, the relationship between what you say about Jesus and what's implied about yourself. If you call him Lord, then do you live as his disciple, following his way to the T? Or are you a part-time acquaintance of Jesus who kind of does your own thing once you leave these beautiful and holy four walls. My brothers and sisters, it's time to get the answer to that question right. Our judgment will be based on it. So let us pray that if we dare call him Lord, we may live as his faithful servants despite the cost.